Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Heart of Westmoreland podcast and uh, we're here for our third interview, our third episode and we're very pleased to introduce today Hannah Fox. Give us a wave Hannah. <laughs> we thought it would be really good during these interviews to just to talk to ordinary Christians. We're not saying you're ordinary Hannah. You're very, very special. Um, but we wanted to, um, to be able to just hear from Christians around the area about how they live their lives and, and, and what difference it makes to them being uh, followers of Jesus and uh, knowing God in their lives. So um, welcome, Hannah. Thank you. It's really good to see you. Uh, would you just like to tell us a little bit? I mean, you haven't lived in this area for very long, have you? Would you like to tell us a little bit of your backstory about how you came to be here and, and, and that kind of thing? Sure. So um, I moved up here about three and a half years ago when I got married to my husband, Adrian Fox. Um, and before that, I was living down in, in Cheshire. Um, that's where I'm, I'm originally from, just south of Manchester. Um, had spent eight years down in Surrey, but otherwise Cheshire is really where I spent most of my life. Uh, went to school there. Um, and I met my husband at a dance class down in Cheshire doing modern jive. And... Um, the rest is history. We, got, we ended up getting married um, and I moved up here originally to Gaze Gill, um, just near T-Bay. Um, we spent about six months there and then we bought our house here in Brough Sowerby. Brilliant. So, so the big question is, do you still dance? <laughs> not, not too much. Um, in fact, very little since we got married, in fact, but uh, mainly because there are no dance classes near here. Um, I think the nearest one is down in Lancaster, but uh, I, st I still dance in my spirit. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> and, how, and how have you found, found this up here? I love it. It's a world away from from what I grew up with. I, I grew up in suburbia with, you know, everything you could possibly want pretty much on your doorstep. We were 10 minutes away from the Trafford Centre. Um, so it was it was very different when I first moved up here. Um, and I think probably the biggest shock was going from a high street with eight Indian takeaways in it to a 40 minute round trip for an Indian takeaway was was probably the biggest shock. Um, but having moved from Gays Gill to Kirby, uh, near Kirby Stephen, um, I think we found a, a nice compromise in a way of being near to things that we need to be near, but also enjoying the countryside. And I have to say, I really needed um, some peace in my life and a little bit of quiet. Um, I have a very chaotic um, work life and probably quite a chaotic mind. And so it's a really good counterbalance for me to have that, that peace and quiet um, and just to be able to enjoy nature and, and God's lovely creation. Yeah, yeah. And, and so what, what, is, what is your work, Hannah? What do you do for work? So I work for a, a big insurance company um, and I run their purchase to pay system. So it's the IT system um, which the business places their orders with all of our suppliers um, and processes their invoice and manages all the financial controls that sits, sits around that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking billions of pounds of, of spend per year goes through that system. So my job has quite a lot of responsibility that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And I guess you've been working from home then, have you, in the last year? I have. I actually, before the pandemic, I worked from home two days a week anyway. Um, mm. And I work part time. I work four days a week. So two days was from home, two days from the office. So it's not been that hard a transition for me. Um, mm. The big difference is not needing to travel. Um, so I would quite often travel to our other offices in the UK, occasionally in Europe and very occasionally to India um, for work. So that's the biggest difference is not having to travel. So no early starts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm here as well. Yeah. yeah. yeah Andrew. Yeah. I haven't said anything yet, have I? But it, <laughs> um, obviously, Christy and Dan, you know Hannah um, uh, for longer than I have. Um, but uh, we've we've managed to kind of get, get into some sort of contact over the last few. Well, I think particularly since lockdown, really. So I don't think I've really met you in real life. I've just seen you on a screen, which I think is more and more of a common thing, isn't it, uh, recently? But we, we've met, I think, with the filling station that Christian Dan uh, leads. And uh, you, you've um, you've kind of, I think, from my my understanding, you've had quite a lot of uh, interest in music and things. And I uh, just wonder if you want to tell us a little bit about your kind of musical background. Sure. So I, I love music. I absolutely love music. I um, 
learned in school to uh, starting off with I played the recorder and the guitar. Uh, my mum used to run a folk guitar class in her spare time, uh, which was no mean feat because she had pretty bad arthritis. Um, but I think she really did it for the fun. So I, I learned with recorder and guitar, uh, went on to play uh, piano and take singing lessons um, and reached a reasonably good standard grade seven in one grade eight in the other. Um, and I joined the, the, the worship band in my church when I was pretty young playing the flute. Um, uh, so I also did flute as well. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, quite, quite musical to start with. But um, so I joined the worship group playing the flute and I guess that was really when I found my heart for music because you had freedom to express you weren't playing off sheet music um, and you could improvise and you could just feel where the music was going and and kind of go, go with it and, and play with it mm -hmm. so I loved that um, and uh, so, sorry I'm distracted by your wife's impressive uh, child oh, I'm just saying I'm, I'm signaling to her if you can't see I'm in a podcast but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's okay. <laughs> Fine. It's all part of life. It is. <laughs> yeah. So really, I, I kind of I came from a musical upbringing in that sense, um, and it's kind of come and gone a little bit in my adult life. Um, I think you lose the diligence in your adult life when work takes over a regular practice and things like that. So, um, and when I moved house, I moved to a house that couldn't accommodate my piano, um, which was uh, slightly problematic. Um, so my piano now lives at my younger sister's house. Um, and so really now it's her piano and her kids and her kids are learning, which is great. Um, and my husband a couple of years ago bought me a keyboard for Christmas. So I've kind of got back into that fairly recently. Um, my, my passion uh, really is the modern worship songs. I absolutely love the modern worship songs. I think the expression in them is incredible. Um, and that's not to disrespect traditional um, music. Um, that's the foundation really of everything. But um, I, I love it when music moves you. I absolutely love it when music moves you. And, you know, in some of my difficult times, music has been one of those things that's really kind of got me through um the ability to just cry and sob at a sad song that identifies with exactly how you're feeling sometimes is what you need to be able to let off steam and i, I lived alone for the best part of, of 20 years of my adult life um and so you only really have yourself to rely on and so to have somebody else in the room who's singing about the feeling that you're feeling um, I think can be incredibly supportive mm -hmm. um, and then to have other songs that you can then put on to say right come on snap out of that you need to find the joy again you need to find the hope again and you can put on a song that changes your mood mm -hmm. I think music has an incredible power um, to really lift your spirits and to and to move you forward. Have you written any of your own songs? I have. <laughs> Long <time>. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good guess, so, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I had a tough time in my teenage years, and music was really my outlet. Um, so a lot of the songs I wrote at that time are really probably quite depressing, <laughs> if I'm honest. Teenage songs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, teenage <laughs> angst. <laughs> but um, I haven't, yeah, I haven't written so much recently. I, I, I write when I'm motivated to when something you know when there's a lyric or something that that comes into your head and that really grabs you um so i haven't done that for a while because work and life is taking up a lot of my brain at the moment yeah. um but yeah maybe i'll get back to that someday yeah. so do you just going back i'm interested i'm interested about songwriting and the process behind it and that kind of thing so would you would you sort of you said about having it having a lyric and a thought would you say first of all it's about the words and then you put a tune to it or would you have a tune and then think of words or is it both together? How does it actually happen? For me personally, it's always the lyrics first right. because the, the words are the meaning in the song and the melody fits the meaning and then the accompaniment wraps around that and makes it make sense. Um, so for me, it's always the words first. I think if much as I love some of the modern pop songs and, and they're really feel good, 
a lot of them don't really say very much. Mm. Um, and the music that stuck with me is really the music that speaks. And I think music without lyrics can speak. Mm. Um, but for me, it's, it's the starting point is the lyrics and wanting to say something, um, whether that's to say something to other people. It's less about saying something to other people and more about saying what I need to verbalize, I guess, um, as a form of release. Um, the, the, you know, the, the thoughts that fester in your head don't tend to go anywhere, whereas the thoughts that come out or the, the feelings that come out, um, I don't know, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer that if you say something out loud, the way you hear it through your ear is very different to the way you hear it through your, you know, in, within your own head. And sometimes when you hear it through your ear, you think that sounds ridiculous. Mm. And other times you think, gosh, I, I just hadn't realized that that's how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think music does that for me. Um, it allows you to say things that in words might sound silly, but it allows you to hear how you're really thinking and feeling. Mm. Yeah. I, think, I think maybe, I, mean, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I, I think singing stuff, I'm thinking particularly in church now, but singing stuff can kind of get truth into us as well. You know, sometimes, sometimes, it, sometimes it might be expressing how we're feeling, but sometimes it's also telling us a truth about God or about ourselves or about how God sees us. I don't know if you mm -hmm. relate to that at all. Yeah, it's a bit like those, uh, when they say to people, you know, stand in front of the mirror and have a little mantra that you say to yourself every day, you know, and if you say it often enough, you'll start to believe it. Yeah. Um, and and provided what you're saying is is truth i, I do think that that does happen mm. um yeah. but i think there's a there's so much i mean there's so much for me because singing is so close to prayer um prayer is about doing something kind of here and now you physically speak mm. in order to move the spirit and move heaven mm. so we do something in the physical to have impact in the spiritual and I think, um, you know, the same with crying. Sometimes crying actually, it, it's a physical act, but it moves you spiritually. Um, mm -hmm. And it moves you from a place sometimes of, of, of despair and hopelessness to a place of release and um, creating that space to be filled, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, or just to, to, to be able to let go of some of the stuff that's really holding you down. So I don't know what, I can't remember what the question was now, but I, I've slightly gone off on a tangent. It wasn't really a question actually. It was, I think it was more of a reflection myself that I was thinking that the music, singing stuff can often be a way of us um, taking truth on board. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I was just wondering what, you know, what you thought about that. But, so. Yeah. And, and I think actually talking and you, you know, going into the music, but also your very clear connection with faith uh within music which you're expressing so i wonder if you could just tell us a little bit maybe about the journey uh, of your faith uh, you can tell us from the beginning or from you know where you think is relevant but I, it, it clearly the, there's a there's a a necessary link there to be made so i um, grew up in a christian family uh, my mum and dad are very um committed christian sounds like enough word it doesn't sound like it describes them but they, they live and breathe it, and it, it is them. Um, their faith is them. Um, everything they do uh, comes from that and, and is done from that. So I have a really good um, Christian upbringing, went to Sunday school, um, and when I was 14, I decided that I wanted to be um, baptised. I grew up in a Baptist church, and they did the um, what we refer to as the full dunking. Um, so I decided that I wanted to be full dunked, um, and I did that age 14 in front of, of my congregation. Um, and in all honesty, I think at the time it was more of a head decision and less of a heart decision. Um, I, I mean, clearly I wanted, wanted it, but I don't think up until that point I'd really experienced God in a anything other than an intellectual and um, kind of uh, almost a moral sort of a way if that makes sense um, but I wanted to, I wanted to do the right thing and I wanted to um, be obedient to this God who'd, who'd made me and um, I wanted to love him and you know 
so I think that's where it came from. And very, very shortly after that, and I won't go into detail on this, I, I hit some really difficult times, um, some really challenging times and was left kind of thinking, where the heck is this God? You know, where, where on earth is he? And um, was very, very lost. And I know, I mean, I'd, I'd known of people talk about um, spiritual warfare and spiritual battle and, you know, the, the devil attacking, you know, kind of attacking people. And it all sounded, you know, um, very exciting, but um, a bit kind of not, not something that really happens in real life. And, and I guess in retrospect, I kind of see the, 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 the power of evil at play in that but only in retrospect. At the time, it was just awful circumstances that I had to deal with. And I, I guess I did what any teenage girl would do, was you develop some um, very rapid coping mechanisms. Um, and at the time, I thought I coped reasonably well with it. Um, but I think there comes a point where short-term coping mechanisms stop working, they don't work long term. And so when I hit my um, kind of late teens, early 20s, went to university, um, you know, moved away from home, you know, was kind of out in the big wide world, everything was starting to just fall apart a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I was struggling and just, I, I guess I just got into some habits and some ways and did some stuff I wasn't terribly proud of and just was really lost and I didn't know who I was I just was sad and um couldn't really connect with much um but on the surface I you know I guess like a lot of people who are having tough times everything looked fine on the surface everything looked fine I functioned mm -hmm. um and I probably, you know, wobbled my way through my 20s, you know, in that same state. And it wasn't really until my early 30s and I moved down to Surrey. Um, and I guess that total change of scene. Um, and I started going to a, a church down there, a Church of England church, but it was quite um, a, a modern evangelical um, Church of England down there that I guess I started to confront that. Um, I was diagnosed with clinical depression and started to see a counsellor um, and just really started to kind of unpick the mess. And I think in all of it, I my faith hadn't left me. I just kind of put the book down on the bedside table and not come back to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, in all honesty, I can't remember quite the order in which things happened. I know that I remember the, 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 the kind of the key moments that stick out for me is I remember sitting in a coffee shop in Epsom and it was a busy, bustling coffee shop. And I was you know, sitting there thinking, I know I should be reading my Bible and God's going to speak to me through this Bible. And I'd done that so many times and just read words and been left thinking, well, I have no idea what. And, and two minutes later, I couldn't even remember what I'd read. Mm. But this one time, I read the story about the prodigal son. And, and the line that struck me was that the, the father ran to the son. He ran to him. Like, and I got this impression of this son who'd been such a disappointment. And his father ran to him and threw his arms around him and just was so pleased to see him. Mm. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, I'm... I'm that child who's the disappointment. And the next bit I read was about Jesus going into the desert at Lent um, to be tempted by the devil. And it says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And I just sat there thinking, that's really sick. You know, the Holy Spirit leading <laughs> Jesus into the desert to be <laughs> tempted by the devil. It's quite sick. Um, but it was a necessary thing. And I think I had a realization that, you know, 
God doesn't wish bad things on us, but sometimes he needs to take us into the desert in order that we can learn the things that we need to learn and that so he can accomplish what he needs to accomplish. And I think somehow something changed in me at that point. And I think it was that I suddenly opened the book and said, you know, I'm willing to start. And, and that's a metaphorical book. That wasn't necessarily the Bible. It's a metaphorical book. But I, I opened the book up again and said, I want to kind of pick up where I left off and keep going on this on this journey. Um, you know, I, I did I did a range of things like, you know, I took medication and I'm not ashamed to say it. It really helped me. Mm. Um, I saw a counsellor. In all honesty, that was not so helpful. Um, it, you know, no disrespect to the counsellor. It just it, it didn't do anything massively significant for me. Um, I know it works tremendously well for some people. And, and um, but I think at that point, I'd done a lot of thinking already. Um, and yeah, so anyway, I, I, I kind of picked up where I left off and, you know, started, I guess, throwing myself into every course that was available. Um, you know, there was a prayer day going at, at church to kind of tell you about prayer. I would be, okay, well, you know, what the heck, I might learn something, I'll go. Um, and and there was one thing that someone said that really stuck with me, which was, because I thought I'd lost my faith. I really thought I'd lost it and that I would have to kind of almost like start from scratch again. And, and even though metaphorically, I was thinking I want to pick up the book and pick up where I left off. I kind of thought that God wanted me to recommit my life to him from scratch again. And I remember somebody saying, when you get baptized, what little, what, whatever faith you have, whether it's big or small, the act of getting baptized seals that faith in, mm -hmm. never to be lost. And so even if there was the tiniest little grain of faith there, when you got baptized, that got sealed in. And for me, that was a real encouragement that, you know, it brought back that memory that the father running to the son, um, that God hadn't forsaken me because I'd stopped talking to him for a while or, you know, my head had been in a bad place or um, I'd done some stuff that I wasn't massively proud of. Um, I felt like a disappointment. You know, he, that didn't matter. What mattered was that I'd chosen to walk back home. Um, and so along that journey and looking back I learned so much I learned that through my hardship I have a compassion for other people that I didn't know I had mm -hmm. um that I see hurt in other people that I didn't see before so it allows me to connect with people on a more meaningful um in a more meaningful way um and coming back to the music I'd kind of lost my music in the same way that I'd kind of, my faith had been almost put on pause a little bit. M my music had been put on pause and, you know, music is music, right? So whether you're listening to a sad song or a, or a happy song, it, it, to a certain extent, it can reflect your mood, but to a certain extent, it can also be the mood that you want to have. Mm -hmm. And so music again for me now is part of, um, professing what I believe, um, praising God for what he's done, no matter how hard it was. And allowing music to speak to all of those different emotions, all of those different circumstances. Um, and allowing that in a way to be the picture, the ups and downs of music are the ups and downs of my life. And that paints a beautiful picture in the same way that it um, it creates beautiful music. You know, music is is, is rubbish if it's one flat note, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want crescendos, you want stand up for the key change. Sometimes you want those really, really quiet withheld moments to really give it um, flavor. And so, it, you know, for, for me, music has been a common theme, even though the style of music has varied quite, quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a wonderful analogy for, for the story of, of how God's worked in my life. There's yeah. been real highs, there's been real lows, but 
thank you thank you for that Hannah it's amazing you know we, we keep we keep joking about this we have all these people who self-interview beautifully yes <laughs> because you, you're you know I was thinking when you were talking I was thinking my, my next question would be you know well how do you think that experience changed you but you've talked about that already so beautifully yeah. and um I mean I've got another question if that's okay um which is um Often when we but when we hear somebody's testimony, we hear the story about how they became a Christian quite, you know, quite appropriately. And that was really good to hear that story. So I'm wondering, but I'm wondering, uh, what do you think God is doing in your life at the moment that might be new or or just just that you that you've noticed recently? There's a part of me that says I don't really know. Um, I know he's doing something. I'm not entirely sure I know what it is yet because I, I have a feeling he doesn't always let you in on the plan up front, um, which for my strategic brain is, is quite challenging sometimes. But um, I, I know I've been put here in Cumbria for a reason. And that's part of the bit of I don't know, because I feel sometimes a bit like, what on earth am I doing here? Um, but, you know, I, I've, I've taken on a role as church warden in my church recently, and I'm really passionate about, um, you know, doing things like developing the mission action plan, um, making sure that we not only look after our existing congregation, but also look at, um, you know, what we can do for our wider communities. I, I have a heart for, for being um, outward looking, not inward looking, um, although I do think it is important to look after the people that, that you've got. Um, so I'm excited about what he's what, what God's going to do and, and how I can play a part in that. Um, I think on a very personal level, um, I love I love just walking alongside people and encouraging people. Um, you know, people have tough times all the time. And um, I'm not saying that I always have a heart for everybody's circumstances, because it, it always helps when you can relate to somebody's circumstances. Um, but I think to just be able to walk alongside people that put, that God puts in your path and, and on your heart and to be able to encourage them um, and, and to be able to let them know that they, they don't, they don't need to feel alone. Other people have walked some of those paths that they, they won't have experienced their, their, their individual experience, but they will be able to understand enough to, um, to take away people's shame and fear and sense of hopelessness because they know that somebody has walked that path before um your experience of walking a path is, is, is always going to be different one person to the next you know someone notices um the trees and someone notices the flowers someone um finds it hard work someone finds it easy you know your experience of walking along a path is different but to know that somebody has walked that same path before and has made it um through those tough times I think I think it's an incredible privilege and I often think that the, the privilege of being able to encourage someone is far greater than the privilege of being encouraged um it, it's 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 like the double blessing it's like the double blessing that the bible talks about that to be able to take your tough times and to be able to use those use those experiences to make somebody else's day better, even in a tiny little way, is just, oh, it's amazing. Yeah. I love I love that. Privilege, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Really good. Thank you, Hannah. Um, da, uh, Andrew, you're looking like you're going to say something. No, well, I mean, I'm looking at the time and it's quarter yeah, to already. I and we said we said we'd talk for about half an hour and then it's kind of gone. <laughs> <laughs> and the fascinating conversation that we're having. And part of me wants to reflect on on what you said, Hannah. And often I mean the first podcast, we've only done two. You're the third, you're the third one. And first one we had a little bit of a talk afterwards and I think that was well received by people and the second one we haven't but I thought I think it's helpful to just just to recognize I think even just with you in the room had it about the, the the journey that you've been on in and I think how a lot of people will probably be able to relate to that uh, that that feeling of lostness and that uh, 
and even it, maybe particularly now, maybe this has been a time for people where they have felt more lost than normal. And and actually, they've never felt that lostness before. But because of the the pandemic, because of the complete change in life circumstances, this is a a time where that that might be true for them. And I really feel passionately that we need to have a space for that in our in our faith and in our churches to be able to express that lostness. Mm-hmm. It might not feel right. It might not feel good, but it's nevertheless the journey that we find ourselves on and, and recognizing that we're human uh, and we, we get stuff wrong and we find ourselves lost and we feel broken. And the, the need, I feel that we need to not pretend that everything's okay. And, and so I want to thank you more than anything for sharing that really with us because um, that it's an important message to hear right now. It is. I think, I think one of the, um, going back to the music side of things as well, is that something that's really, really struck me is if you read the Psalms, you know, the, the hymn book in the Bible, you've got, you've got wonderful, isn't, it, isn't everything wonderful Psalms? You've got what's going on Psalms. You've got how we got to wait Psalms. We've got this is terrible. What's going on? What's, what, 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 sort of Psalms. And in the, the general sort of output nowadays, it seems to be very much about nice experiential you can count on the fingers of of one hand the the lament songs that exist the modern lament songs that 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 are around there just aren't any or very very few or they just touch on it but then it all gets better and i think that's something that is missing from from um worship music because the music can engage it can actually say no this is a real feeling and it's okay to have that feeling because look the Bible's got it in two, you know, the people, so many of the people who, who we read about in the Bible went through the most terrible situations and they weren't sort of putting a, putting a false grin on it. They were pouring out their heart and saying, what's going on? And I think we need that. We need to be able to sit in that place, which is, which is, which is, you know, what we often will do in a church service is just, we'll have a bit of a, we'll have a confession right now. We've got that out of the way, you know, and now we're going to do this. You know, we're just not allowed to sit with the grief. And I think there's a lot of grief around, a lot, a lot of, you know, not just because of people dying, but uh, so much bereavement to do with friendships and uh, loss of jobs and status and identity and all sorts of things. I think, I think that... even also just that grief of um, not just, even in the tiny little things, like not being able to go and have a, coffee in a coffee shop Mm -hmm. the the repeated nature of that Mm -hmm. leaves you with a grief that grief at just not living life to the full yeah you know and it's you know that's not the same as someone you know losing somebody or or losing a job which is a massive impact to your every day but that those tiny impacts every day over a prolonged period yeah yeah can, can can really carry a weight and I think the uncertainty that goes with it as well, you know, that we don't quite know when we're going to be able to do that. I mean, there is a roadmap, but, but the, the way things have been, have unfolded over the last year has meant that we've learned not to trust um, stuff like that. So that that kind of sense of, well, when will we be able to, it's been really difficult. I mean, yeah. I, I, go, go on, Hannah. I was going to say, have you got time for one more anecdote? Yes. Ooh, yes, yes, yes. yes. So, <laughs> I, I often joke, I'm going to tell you about the, the cat who taught me to pray, um, because it's, it's something that I often say, oh, a cat taught me how to pray, but, it, but in many respects, it's true. Um, when I lived in Surrey, um, I, I bought my house down there, and um, it took me a little while to get myself set up, so my cats had been at my mum and dad's house, and when I properly moved in, um, my cats came um, down, and literally within the space of four days, one of my cats managed to get out the house when um, I I wasn't there and was gone. And I stupidly then let the other cat out early. So I didn't wait the the two to four weeks that he's supposed to wait. I let the other cat out early in the hopes that he might find the other cat and bring him home. You know, how daft was that? But one cat did, I did get a phone call after 14 days saying that one cat had been found and I got him back, but the other one didn't come back. And I had this real strong belief that this cat was, had not been run over, it was just lost. And I used to go out in the garden and 
just in my head I would be saying God like you know like you know where the cat is and I know you know where the cat is and I really don't believe he's dead because you haven't put it on my heart to believe he's dead so I just I really want to know where he is and that he's safe and that he's got food and I know you know where he is and and, and the conversation would go on in my head like this and quite often when I was out in the garden you know I'd call his name I'd physically call his name Leo Leo and um you know you kind of know it's stupid because if he could hear you he would have come home you know so you know he's out of the area where he'd be able to hear you but but God could hear me and so this went on for a good you know couple of years and my dad who is a very very quiet um introverted man um phoned me up one one day I was due to be going to South Africa for Christmas because my boyfriend at the time lived uh, his mum was over in over in South Africa we were visiting her and my dad phoned me up and said oh, I was sitting in church this morning and I just felt God saying that when you go to South Africa you're going to be blessed and I thought oh that's nice how lovely didn't think anything of it um so eight weeks later, we go to South Africa. We're sitting in a little wood hut in the middle of a, a, a safari park um, complex. Um, we're watching the warthogs walk past and the monkeys come and try and steal our fruit. Um, and I got a phone call from a vet who was about 20 miles away from where I lived in Surrey to say, we've got your cat. So I merrily informed her, well, you can't have my cat because my cat's at home with my parents for Christmas while I'm in South Africa. And she's like, no, no, it, well, it definitely says it's your cat. The microchip says it's your cat. And suddenly it clicked. It's, it's the other cat. It's the one who's been lost for two years, no. not the one who's at home in Manchester. And I was in tears. I had snot running down my face. You know, it was, it, I was a mess. But God had answered my prayer after two years. Mm -hmm. And my prayer had been as simple as, I know you know where he is. I just want to know he's safe. And I'd negotiated, I'd, you know, if, if a lovely family's found him and the kids have fallen in love with him, I'll let them keep him. I just want to know he's safe. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, so, so in many respects, it was the cat who taught me how to pray because that was my foundation for really talking to God about the things that really mattered to me and really letting him know how I felt and really ha expecting, a, you know, a conversation you know, I was expecting an answer on this one, whereas previously I'd probably prayed the prayers that I thought you ought to pray in the way that you ought to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think that sometimes the, the little things yeah. are, are so worth the, the effort to talk to God about because they matter to him. As much as they matter to you, they matter to him. And he wants you to know that they matter. Yeah, yeah. That's that's lovely. That, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So yeah, that was my cat story. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was gonna say I've got a similar story about a dog, but I won't take time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite the same. But it's it <laughs> <laughs> and prayer i'll not bring up the fact that i'm allergic to cats and it'll just ruin, <laughs> ruin the whole thing um but well, well i think it'll be a good idea just to end but just i want to ask you what's your favorite piece of music at the moment hannah do you know it's funnily enough it's the song we sang at filling station last night um it, uh it the goodness of god the goodness of god you know and, that, that was going through my head when you were talking i thought yeah. that, that is so yeah go on, go on and it's the line in it your goodness is running after it's running after me yeah. you know so this this sense of like the prodigal son like god is coming at you going i want to be good to you i want to be good to you and you know and, and he's, he's chasing you down to be good to you that's like wow what an amazing god yeah yeah, so I love it. I love it. I so mean, we definitely need to play that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> there's, there's one other song. I don't know whether you know it. Um, by a lady called Laura Story. It's called Blessings. Do you know what, Hannah? I have literally just put a song in by Laura Story. I've never heard of her before until today. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> she's just I literally just put a song in for, for the Sunday service that I'm doing. But yeah, go on. Yeah that's a beautiful song that talks to that feeling of 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 lost and bewilderment there's um so the lines in it are um what if our 
What if our blessings come through raindrops? What if our healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? Wow. And that really speaks to that, for me, that sense of, oh, I just, I don't know what's going on. I'm desperate. But actually, that God can still talk through those, through that upset, through that pain. Sometimes that's the, 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 the way that we feel that closeness to him. It's, an, it's a lovely song. Highly recommend listening to it. That's that. It does sound like I'll be. I'll be looking for that. I might have to. You might have to remind me. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you for that. That I mean, and and it's yeah. I, I, I about a year or so ago, I remember being quite interested. In this concept of, which is in a lot of Christian traditions, of the, this the dark night of the soul, and you know, the feelings that Christians have on, on, on this and, well, should we even have a dark night of the soul uh, for some people? But in, in essence, we're, we find we're human. <laughs> we find we're in, in, this, in this situation, whether or not we would like it or not, where we find ourselves dislocated and disconnected for whatever reason and find ourselves in searching and wondering. And whether whether you know the, the rightness or the wrongness is kind of besides the point for me now it's it's the reality of it mm. you know for us that matters and that god meets us in that reality wherever we are and there's a there is a real sense that i think we should be okay with the fact that we we are in that reality we that we do look outside and as you say we are you know th those little things that we can't do build up mm. Mm. Uh, and uh, the things that on the big things that we can't you know can't do you know jobs and not being able to see family and and, and the likes build up uh, and and there is a sense that we aren't you know we encounter darkness and 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 evil and and things in our lives and to you know to recognize that humanity in us but also to recognize there's a there's a God who wants us and a God who cares and a God who has grace for us and a God who wants to see this whole thing renewed as much as we do, if not more. There yeah. is, there is real life in, I know it sounds weird, but there's real life in dark times. The times that have been the darkest are the times that I felt most alive. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's because you grow more in the tough times than you do when things are nice and easy. You know, one thing that people have been doing through the pandemic is really building resilience and resilience is a massively underrated skill. Mm -hmm. um, but resilience is so important to, to get through life. And mm -hmm. so if, if we have to have some tough times to learn that, then we have to have some tough times to learn that, right? Yeah, I was listening to something a little while back talking about um, how we grow in the, the hidden place we we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there are times when we feel we've been knocked out of life for whatever reason. And, and, um, uh, and it may be because of bereavement or illness. It may be because just of a, str of a struggle we're having. And we feel like we're not um, necessarily having a big impact on the world around us. And, and we may or may not be. But the point is that if we allow him to, God is able to do some growing in us in that time and, and and it reminds me of like when you when you bury a seed in the ground and it's hidden you know but the life the life is growing mm. in the dirt mm. Mm. <laughs> and the heat and the cold even those extremes are affecting the growth of that seed mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah you know mm. and the torrential rain or the drought is affecting that seed yeah 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 thank you so much hannah yeah. for your time <laughs> really thank great you. For your insights, for your your you know your honesty as well, uh, really really helpful time uh, for for us here sitting here. I'm sure Dan and Christy will agree, but also um, you know hopefully people listening as well. And uh, God bless you and everything that you're doing with your work, your family, and we hope that we'll be able to see you in real life at some point. <laughs> That'd be nice. Play some music together. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. It was wonderful. My pleasure. Okay. God bless. Take care.